Actually, not much, not much hotter than it is. It's pretty close. Is everybody back that's coming back? So uh, this little hammer here, um, I built the, or reforged this. It's just a four
Heck, there's one under that anvil too. There's flatters everywhere. <laughs> that doesn't matter. We're not going to do that this heat anyways. So as the day goes on and I get a little bit more tired, I kind of go to a lighter and lighter hammer. If you can get it by forging, it's uh, going to save you time filing, grinding, or whatever else you're doing. I'm, I'm not the least bit shy about using that big belt grinder. If anybody had, hadn't looked, this uh, Wilton square wheel grinder runs at, I think it's 4,600 feet per minute. So it's like driving 50 miles an hour down the road and dragging your axe out the car, car window on the pavement. And it does a very effective job, it's getting a little hotter, of the uh, rough grinding. It is way too fast for really fine finish grinding after it's been hardened and tempered, is it'll uh, take the temper out before you realize you've hung out a little bit too long on it. But for the rough grind, it works great. about all I'm going to do to the, uh, the blade. We're going to flatter that next. Oh, we got plenty of time. Yeah. Um, I seriously doubt it. Um, you know, at one point they did, you know, 100, 100 and something years ago, they, that's the way they were still made probably. But uh, yeah, if you buy an axe from the store, it is probably cast or drop forged. Um, and it's going to be all one steel and it's probably hardened, the same hardness throughout. So it's a predictable and reliable thing, but in theory, the forged axe gives you a much tougher axe because it's not hard and brittle at the eye and you're not going to break the eye. Well, you can have a very hard, very fine cutting edge because of the ability to, to harden just that steel. Um, whether that means anything when you're trying to take a tree down, maybe not, but I like the theory. Yeah, yeah, unless you're buying a Grand Forest Brooks axe from Sweden, probably you're not getting a, a forged axe. They're, they're being cast or drop forged. Okay, again. Let me look at it. Yeah, it's pretty straight. Yeah, hold, hold on just a second. As long as we're here, I like to sign my stuff. You don't need to hit that very hard.
Okay. Pretty good. So with any luck, we don't have to go back to the blade at all to forge, although invariably you end up going back a little bit just to straighten things out and take the, the wonkies out of it. Now like I say, this is the, the hardest part of the axe to, to hold on to that it kind of wants to move around on you a little bit. These uh, V-bit tongs, if you try all of the ones in your pile, frequently you can get one that, that holds that and flares out a little bit. I think are a little better than flat bit tongs for that job. No, but I've been thinking about, or you mean, you mean like these? Oh, no. That might work really well. Oh, I don't want that axe. After all that foraging, frequently the eye is squished so far down that you can't get your drift into it. And sometimes you've got to be a little creative to get it open. Uh, no, no I'm not at the moment anyways. So I'm going to start just by driving, and that'll wedge up in there. I find the vise to be a really good place to do this because you can support the whole, the whole axe. So all I want to do now is just get that opened up. And then hopefully I can get the drift I actually want to work with into there. That's one advantage of this monster drift is it, it will do a whole range of sizes. So it'll go in when the eye is a little tight and you can slide it up. It is certainly not a necessity by any means. This is, this is all the drift you got to have. Don't, don't feel like I'm saying you got to go home and make, spend, spend four hours forging a jackhammer bit out into some big old drift. This is also a little bit harder to drive in the vise because it's so stinking tall. This eye may actually be a little smaller than I wanted. I, we may have to use the littler handle. <laughs> it pays to have a variety of handles if you're doing a lot of axes. This handle's not that much longer, but it's a whole lot bigger for a whole lot bigger axe. Although I think, personally, this 14-inch handle to me feels a little light these are about one pound, 10 ounce heads when they're done. And I, I like the 16 inch handle better. That feels good. This isn't bad, but it's a little heavy. Not too bad. I think this is too much for, for an axe this size. Per, personal preference though. Yeah, I don't know where they draw the line though. Uh, I think they're all axes. I think a hatchet is just a small axe, but I don't know at what point you quit calling it a hatchet. I, 
I would probably, you know, if I if I had to say, I would call these hatchets, not not axes. But I still, if you, you talk to the uh, the wood carvers, and these are really that would be my target audience for most of these are people who are using them for spoon carving and other woodworking work. They just call them carving axes. They don't call them ax hatchets. Try and keep the eye even. If it starts to stretch a little bit, you don't want it to stretch on one side. Let's see. And try to uh, put the drift in from both sides, not just always from the same side. You want that hourglass shaped eye. And unfortunately, the drift cools the axe off really fast. It might go in there. So this may be the last time I, I drift it. And then we will go on to hardening the other axe. In case you want to look at the tools later, the ones on the floor were hot when I put them there. Check them before you pick them up. I'm just going to flip it. Well, have I missed anything you think I should have talked about before we uh, are finished with the forging steps? Okay. No more. So this is my final sizing, and like I say, drift from both sides. And when you when you forge it flat here, um, I was afraid of that. You can do that all day long at home. You just can't do it in public. When you're forging the, the ears down, forge at the fat end of the drift because you're trying to get that hourglass taper. If you forge down here, you just closed up the part of it you did before. So you're just hitting right there in that, that spot. Don't hit here. So that... is all of the forging that I plan to do, I think. It's pretty symmetrical. Um, there'll be some, some grinding. Like I say, I, it doesn't bother me to grind. I try to get it as close as I can by forging so I don't have to do as much grinding. But I'm, I'm willing to grind. So we are going to bring that up just a very dull glow. I guess I'll go behind Gordo and, and somewhere back there there's a bucket of sand I'm going to put it in to so just so you know I'm going to go back there with something hot I mean I, I don't know if we have to bring it out or if I, I can just take it back there well okay Yeah, yeah, if it's uh, small enough to bring out, I thought it was too too heavy to carry. I was just going to leave it back there. <laughs> so the first step in heat treat, 
Everybody knows what heat treating is, more or less? Anybody just really need a more involved explanation? Okay. The first step in heat treating is to normalize or anneal. Uh, normalizing would be air cooling for something other than air hardening steel. Annealing is cooling as slow as you possibly can to get the steel as soft and relaxed. So I'm going to put it in this bucket of sand so it's insulated and I'm going to leave it there until it's cool enough to handle and then I'll do the grinding. And this isn't as vital because I am using a power grinder as it would be if you were using a pedal sandstone grinder or filing. If you don't anneal and you're hand filing, you're doing a whole lot more hand filing than you would be if you annealed. Because it's, especially if it's air hardens at all, you're going to be wearing out files instead of filing your, your ax. Um, I do sometimes. I have not figured out how to hold these efficiently enough in the vise to, to hot rasp them without putting a vise mark in them. I'm, We're used to air hardening steels a bit? Uh, I never have, or not intentionally. What I actually prefer for the cutting bit, and the whole axe doesn't have to get buried because it's only that cutting edge that's in question. Um, I prefer water hardening steels. I like W1 or like a 1095, but for an axe, it doesn't need to be as razor sharp as a razor, and it needs to be tough enough that you can abuse it a little bit. So I oil harden them, and they don't ever get quite as hard and brittle, but they get plenty hard enough. You know, they're, they're harder oil hardened than what I'm going to temper it to. I'm still going to temper it, temper it back and I, that makes me a little more comfortable because I've had some knives I've done out of W1 that have cracked in water, but it seems to behave very nicely in oil. I may be overheating them, it's hard to say. Um, so that, that's going to anneal. Then I'm going to grind it until it looks roughly like this. Uh, this one hadn't been hardened or tempered. So this will be the next thing. So. Uh, Hardening is bringing it up to a critical temperature and cooling it fast so that it stays. I, I am a lousy metallurgist. I can't explain face-centered cubits or whatever they are and, and what the carbon does and where the molecules go, but basically annealed is relaxed. Heat it, cool it fast. It's as hard as you can possibly make it. And we don't, we can't use it that hard. You have to then soften it a little bit. And that's the tempering process. But first we have to do the hardening process. Uh, don't get it too hot yet because I'm not quite ready to quench it. Yeah, if you, if you want to take care of the oil. That was the next step. So I'm going to use olive oil. Um, at home I use uh, tempering oil it is sold as tempering oil. I don't know what brand it is, it's just oil. Um, but I don't like old motor oil because it stinks and I have no idea what the impurities in it are, so I would rather not use it. I'm using olive oil here because it was sort of available and because it smells a lot better. And in a crowd like this, I don't really want to stink the place up any more than we have to. What's that? Yes. This smells like your bacon cookies and you'll all be ready for the, the get together after this. <laughs> right. <laughs> it won't be because I finish it with Johnson's paste wax and I don't think it's food safe. Okay, is there an extension cord I can use? Are you plugged into that blue one? Um, Something is plugged into that blue one. Oh, the orange one's not.
Yeah, I think right there is probably just fine. It'll cool a little bit over going over there, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Okay. So for the uh, tempering process, I'll explain that just a little before this gets hard, hot, uh, because you kind of got to do one right after the other. We are going to heat it, quench it, and before the entire axe is cooled off, I have to clean up the edge enough that I can see the uh, oxide colors. Anybody that's ever ground, sharpened a knife or something on a grinder and gotten it blue and somebody says you ruined it, that blue is an oxide color that tells you roughly what temperature you got it to. I want to take this kind of in the upper bronze starting to turn purple range but you can only see that on shiny metal. You can't see that unless you clean it up first. So I'm going to use the angle grinder because it's fast and easy and I can probably get it shiny enough that everybody can see it. A uh, traditional way of doing that is with a brick and just scrub it. I found that new hard, really hard bricks don't scrub up very well and old wore out softer bricks seem to grind better but we couldn't find a brick anywhere around here so we're going to use the angle grinder. But that's all kind of one process real quick. Okay, we need to bring that up to red. The classic method for testing for the critical temperature that people always like to talk about is magnetic. When the magnet quits sticking, you're at about the right temperature. A little hotter than that usually. But remember, we have two different metals. We don't care about the critical temperature of mild steel because we can't harden it. So if you're testing for magnetic here, you're seeing if the mild steel is magnetic. You've got to be testing the very ed edge and then matching that color to the whole axe that you're trying to harden because if you're back here and it's non-magnetic, it's really irrelevant if the mild steel is non-magnetic. Um, the best way is in that thing that John's got his hand on over there. You look up the specs for the steel that you, know, you bought and you know exactly what it is and you follow whatever the book says you do in the little heat treating oven and you get the exact same results every time. And Scott helped me set up an oven almost just like that and that's the way I plan to do it in the future. But for, for here and now, this is a little more expedient and this, people have been hardening and tempering like this for thousands of years and it works. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to try this magnet that's got a handle on it because it keep my fingers a little further away than the little magnet. So this isn't at all even. So even if this is non-magnetic and that's non-magnetic there, I can't harden this because we're not all the same and it's going to be very uneven. But I can tell that this color isn't the color I want. That color there, that's the color I want. So if I get the whole axe to that color, so now I've educated myself what I'm looking for, and I can start, and as that cools down a little bit, right in there it's magnetic again. So all about, okay. about there. So doing a few tests and taking your time to heat it up so it's even, if you get it hot on the outside and the core of the metal is still cold, then after you've sharpened it three or four times, you're liable to be into something that doesn't hold an edge anymore. Uh, you know, we probably have that much, after we draw that out, that much tool steel trapped inside that axe. You're going to be able to, if you get the whole thing hard, you're going to be able to sharpen that for 100 years before you wear out all the tool steel. If you just get the very edge hard, then it's going to start being dull. No, no, don't turn the blower on. We're good. My grandfather, we've been using it for generations of our own. But it is the original act. 
Right. <laughs> so we're, I'm going to quench this, and of course that's going to flame up, which is why I put it in a metal can. Try and keep your fingers out of it. And try and keep it moving in the oil. At home I use five gallons of oil, and it probably cools just a little bit better. But I don't want to quench the whole thing because that's where I'm getting my heat for the tempering process. Oh, that's way better than motor oil. And I'm just going to cool that just a hair in the water just to make sure it's good and cold. Okay. I think I stretched my tongs out during all that for forging. They got kind of hot. So if you can see that, that's already starting to change color a little bit. It's starting to turn just a little bit in the straw range. If it starts to go too fast, I'll cool it. And at this point, I don't mind cooling it in water because it's, it's past the critical temperature. John, can you on the So you can kind of see the straw. And over here, you, you can start, see it's starting to turn kind of purple. So I'm going to cool that just a little bit. Then we're going to bring it back and it seems like the corners always heat up a lot faster than the rest of it does. And I try to cool it kind of incrementally here so that the whole thing gets tempered to about the same. What color are you going for? I kind of go for, uh, the, I guess they call it peacock, just, just short of, it's starting to turn a little bluish but not that deep blue. And it sort of depends on what you're going to use the axe for. If it's really a carving axe, you can leave it harder than if it's an axe you're going to take out in the field and cut trees with. And I think I'm pretty happy with that. And if we're really lucky, we can do it twice. So I'm going to flip it over and polish the other side. This may take a lot longer because it's lost a lot of its heat. Uh, sometimes it never gets back up to the color I want. Are you worried about over tempering the, the farthest in part of that? Um, that, that is, that's a reality. Um, every time you sharpen it, it's going to get a little bit softer. Um, that's another reason doing it in the controlled for, furnace, quenching the entire thing and then putting this in another controlled environment at the exact temperature you want guarantees that 100% of the steel is hardened and tempered exactly the same. And that's a much more accurate way to do it. But this may not have enough heat left in it to temper a second time. And the only reason I do that is to guarantee that it's even, as even as I can throughout. Um, Sometimes you'll hear somebody re referring to a, a knife or a tool that has lost its temper. It hadn't really lost anything. They've just sharpened it back to the point that it no longer is in the, the part that was hardened sufficiently. It's back in the part that's, that's a little soft. It doesn't really hurt the tool that much other than now you just have to sharpen it more often. But yeah, that, that's an ex excellent question. It's, uh, you, you absolutely, the further back you sharpen this, the softer that steel is going to be. Whether you ever notice that in your lifetime and are, are aware that now it doesn't hold an edge as well is sort of doubtful. If you do that, can't you just rehard it? Go through the same process all the way? Absolutely. If you, if, you, if you use this so often that you cannot, there's no steel left to sharpen, you can put it back in the fire 100 years from now and weld another piece of steel to it. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I don't know how long it would take. You know, if, if this was a daily use tool for somebody and they were working eight hours a day 
doing whatever it is you would do with this. You would wear it out a whole lot faster than any of us will. You know, we, we don't use tools like our forefathers used tools. So that's, that's just not moving at all. I don't think I'm going to get another temper out of that. That's still silver. Um, you know, you could, and sometimes I'll do that. I don't think it's really critical at this, this point to do that. Uh, mostly because I don't want to go way over, although we still have a little bit of time. But, uh, when you quench that in the oil, it's only partially in there, you're not going to like stone that cold on that edge, are you? No, I, I think that's another one of those theoretical ideals, is that you go completely cold. But by the time that's completely cold, this is too cold to push the tempering colors. Yeah, yeah. In theory, you should be able to touch it. Um, I, I think uh, what we know about tool steels today and what modern tool steels ask us to do was not really the reality when this was the common way of making an axe. I think. Simple tool steels are more forgiving of simple methods. Um, if you're doing this with something really exotic, that probably matters a whole lot more than. So if you're using H13 for your axes, you're probably into a whole another can of worms than. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's not going to draw again, so I'm just going to go ahead and cool it off and we'll pass it around. And then this evening I will try to grind, harden, and temper the one we actually forged. And with any luck, both of them will be in the silent auction by tomorrow night. I hope. No promises. What's that? They gotta finish the sundial. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to warm that up just a hair because there's something I forgot to do. We, we don't want it to glow and we don't want to draw any more tempering colors. We just want it to get warm. I'm going to make it stink in here for a minute. I kind of like uh, Johnson's paste wax for a finish. Put on just hot enough that it smokes a little bit. I don't know why, I just do. That comes from past years at this conference, uh, and I think it was Rob Gunther that talked about looking at Johnson's paste wax under the electron microscope to see how far it soaked into the material or something. So. So I'm going to let that cool just a hair. Where, where do you want it? And that will be done except for the final finish. I'll do as much as I can on this grinder, but I can't really sharpen it because I'll burn it. Um, if somebody buys the ax in the silent auction and they want me to take it home and sharpen it and mail it to them, I'll take it home, sharpen it, and mail it to them. If you want to take it home and sharpen it yourself, great. That's easier. <laughs> Um, I'll, sh I'll sharpen it on the slower version of that grinder because I have two belt grinders and I'll run it, that one runs at 4,300 feet per, per minute, the other one runs at about 700 feet per minute. And it, I can work a long time and be pretty precise on it without overheating. Um, there's nothing wrong with a whetstone, or oil stone, pedal sandstone grinder. Those are all perfectly valid techniques. So what do we got? I think we're done with the fire. Um, I've got about 20 minutes. I'm not going to probably use up that much time. Are there any more questions about what we've done? Uh, I kind of wrap them up in towels and stuff. I need to ma start making sheaths. I have everything to do it. I just don't have time. <laughs> Uh, my preference, you know, it's easy to rivet one together. My preference would be to sew it. 
and it's not really that hard to sew up you know, with a good awl and a couple of saddle needles, you can sew it up fairly readily, but it still means I gotta spend some time that I don't get to be in the blacksmith shop, and so I haven't really started making sheaths. But it's, it will keep your tool sharper much longer and keep your fingers intact much longer if you make a leather sheath for them. Uh, no. If you want to do that before you fold it, weld another piece of tool steel on the back. I mean, you could use this, a you know, if you're using it as a woodworking tool and you're driving a wooden wedge or something of that sort, you can get away with that. If you're driving nails with this, it's going to deform pretty fast. And if you're hitting steel tools with it, it's going to deform instantly. I mean, you're just going to booger it all up, and it's going to be ugly. And you can see plenty of old axes that look that way. I mean, they're, they're ax half of the axes you find at garage sales are all mushroomed over because somebody's been using them as a hammer, and they aren't hammers. Mm -hmm. They've been driving wedges. Probably. Yeah. You, you should use plastic wedges. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. Or a wooden glut. So... Uh, We'll talk real briefly about handles and the realities of handling an axe like this or potential realities. Um, almost always the handle doesn't fit first go and you're way better off if it doesn't fit. You, you want a, a handle that fills in this direction. Um, it's sort of hard to, to fill, you're not going to, when you wedge it, you're not going to spread any, the length of the axe with the wedge. If the handle's a little loose side to side, you're going to fix that with a wedge. Um, but lengthwise, if, they're, if your handle doesn't fit, there's just going to, you're going to be able to see day, daylight through there. So what I, what I usually end up doing is I, I end up working these in a, in a vise. I, to have some ideas for a really neat thing on my workbench that'll hold it up here so I can kind of get in there with a draw knife and a spoke shave. Um, pad the handle. Because you don't want to muck it up too much. And I think the easiest way to do this is with a rasp. I'm a snob when it comes to rasps. Um, and speaking of, of rasps, you know, these are still in the original shipping container. <laughs> um, I'm going to give Janet a quick plug. Everybody's probably seen her stuff. She makes these uh, nice file rolls for me. And we're working on one for the rasps, but they're a little grabby, so they grab the fabric and, and have different issues. But uh, take care of your files and your rasps. They'll last a lot longer. If you put them in some, something, if you throw them in your toolbox and they rub together, they're just wearing out. Nothing, nothing wears out a file faster than rubbing it against another file. And the same thing goes for these rasps. These are French handmade rasps. They're forged and a little guy with a chisel sits there in a vise and goes chip, 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 chip. There's a video on YouTube. Yes. And yes, they are. That's, what, that's why I'm kind of a snot. Yeah, and they're, they cut way faster and leave a way smoother finish than what you'd buy at Home Depot. Um, that's probably, that doesn't mean you need these for this kind of work, uh, but I bought them for doing more fin finishy kind of work, but they're excellent for this as well. Um, but I just start to, to take the sides off where it was a little bit too fat. And we're going to Go slow and test it. And make sure you don't set that down on something steel. Where did that axe go? So I probably won't really get this in, but that's already starting to, to go down. If you make it too small, you're pretty well done. You know, if you make it really thin and spindly. 
But you can see how fast that, that rasp cuts. The sure form tools and things like this just take a whole lot longer to do that same amount of work with. And with any luck, I'll get handles on, on these tonight, but I don't know if there's really that much time. You need to finish the group project. Right, yeah, that's got to be done first. Personally, my fing I think my fingers are better calibrated than my eyes are. I can feel more irregularities in where the fat spots are. <laughs> By doing this, that doesn't work when you're forging because it's a little bit on the hot side. And we're getting close to the point that those ears are going to start to be an issue. Because they don't just slide down over the top of the handle. And if you make the handle thin enough for the ears to go down, it just really gets kind of thin. Hopefully I'm picking up the same axe head every time and not trying to fit three different axes to this. Okay, that's getting close. Now this, this applies to whether you're making, a, handling a hammer or, a, or an axe. It's the inertia that brings it up onto the handle. You're not dri driving the handle down into the axe, you're, you're letting the inertia of the, the axe head drive it up. So that's as far as those ears will go. That's where they bottom out. This is uh, where you get your Peter Ross compasses. Let's see, can we see that on the, would you rather I go to the other vice? Just nope. tip it up. Just tip it up. So I want the ear to come to this point. So I set that for that dimension. And then I just scratch that line onto the wood. It's kind of hard to see, but that shows me where that ear comes to. And I don't just make a kind of an arbitrary guess at it on both, you know, say, well, that's where it is on this side, so that's where it is on this side. Um, because the handle may not be symmetrical and the ears may not be perfectly symmetrical. So as long as you leave your dividers or your compass, sorry, set exactly the same, you will be moving that the same distance on both sides. And you notice I'm staying, I'm not arc, turning an arc with the compass. You gotta stay parallel to the center line of the ax. Otherwise you're you're making something that doesn't really match, you're expanding on it. And this, I don't know if I'll be able to do here at this vise because it's, uh, they usually clamp this to a bench. See, now it's a little harder to get that out of there. So I've got these lines on there now. And like I guess I don't think I'm going to be able to really show this very well because I need a solid workbench to, to work on and I don't think I've got one. Um, here I go in with a wood chisel and I cut straight down on that line that I just made and I start removing that straight down here, take the material out, straight down, take the material out, try the axe again, back and forth, no matter how careful I do that layout the first time, it never really fits when you get that shoulder cut. But when you're all done, hopefully you have a shoulder that uh, the ear fits right up against. It's kind of hard to tell that that's not anything, but I don't know. I don't know what the best angle is here. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you can really see that. Uh, pick these up and handle them and look at them and you'll see what I'm talking about. But that's the only way I figured out to do those ears 
so that they really fit well and you haven't made this handle really skinny right here. You could, I suppose, flare those ears out really dramatically so that they slide over the top of this, but that's just not the way I like them. This is my aesthetic, it doesn't have to be yours. And I think that's all I got. <laughs>